Hi, it's Jill Schlesinger. On this episode of Jill on Money, we've got words of investing wisdom. You don't go into investing with the thought that it's going to be always a, an up day. There has to be many down days, too, along the way. That's what markets do. And you just have to have that pure and simple understanding markets are going to fluctuate. Welcome to the Jill on Money podcast. We are presented by Marcus by Goldman Sachs. When you have an opportunity to bring an iconic human being into a studio, you just say yes. It doesn't matter whether you have a jet lagged, crazy, sleep deprived presence. You still say yes. And that's what I did. I said yes to Chuck Schwab. Yes, that one. Charles Schwab Investments, you know, he came into the studio, told us about his career. And in between the story about his life, we learned a lot about the financial services industry. Here's our interview with Chuck Schwab. You're listening to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. We are delighted to have a special guest in studio, Chuck Schwab. He is the founder, former CEO. You have some sort of emeritus title now at Charles well, Schwab? I'm a, no, I'm a chairman. I'm executive chairman. That uh, is a good role to have at your own company. To tell me, I have a fantastic CEO who does all the heavy lifting and I just come and show up for the board meetings. Oh, that's Very great. Nice. You've written a new book. It's called Invested. It's uh, the story of your business life. So let me start with a question that we start with every guest. That is, what is the best financial or career decision you've ever made? Well, I think, of course, starting the company. Having early passion about thinking that investors needed another kind of choice about investing. How do you go about it? The old traditional method of selling stocks through stock salesmen really ended up being really old-fashioned and very expensive and not really leading to the best outcome. So I started Charles Schwab and Company with a whole different view and a passion. And what was the view of the street or these big brokerage firms when you opened your doors almost 50 years ago? I always thought that the traditional firms created products or created their ideas about how much money they could make off the product first. That was the first decision. I tried the, a completely different way to look at things. What would be the best thing for customers? What would they really like first? And if they liked it and we could offer it to them and they picked up on it, then we would continue doing it. But if it didn't happen, that was unsuccessful, they didn't like it, we would stop doing it. it. had nothing to do about making money. It was all about making a great deal for our clients. And so what led you to think about the customer first? I mean, you come from a different mold. You don't come from a big Wall Street family. Right. You come from lawyers, right? Right. Father was a lawyer, grandfather, etc. So I always thought, well, what's, you know, what's fair for people? Could we get more people to invest? Because investing, I always, I came to the conclusion early on, because I read a lot of biographies about very successful people in, in the economy. And it came to be that the people who did investing, most of which did it in stocks, some did it in real estate, but investing is really a very powerful thing that made people change their lives in terms of their wealth lives, their success life in business. And yet, when you started this company in the 70s, the vast majority of Americans were able to claim that they were part of a pension. They didn't have to feel like they had to invest. So talk a little bit about how the world of investing changed with the advent of the 401k and that more people were just becoming, I guess, introduced to the concept of investing? Well, all that did occur. The 401ks were introduced. But I think even more important, more powerful uh, movement that was going, people were beginning to live longer. Social Security was sort of a wonderful thing in the 30s when it was introduced. Average man lived until 65. Now that's almost 20 years later now. If you get up to that age, it's usually 80, 85 of the average, and some are very lucky and live beyond that. So the advance in medical science, all those things, and better living and thoughtful way to go about lifestyle and so forth, we're all getting the benefit of that of longer lives. Hence, Social Security simply will not be enough to take care of our lives that the way we have been accustomed our modern lives and we like to travel we like to see tv we like to take vacations you know you know it so when you started the company talk about the beginning and when you felt like 
it's catching on. So if you're in the early 70s, you start this company, it's this crazy guy, Chuck. When did you feel like, okay, this is going to work? Well, it happened. I started with four people uh, with the concept of doing discounted commissions. That was a very simple kind of thing. And that was really started in 73. We began in a very rudimentary way to do that, and it got more and more perfected. And by 1975, the SEC in, in Congress changed the uniformity of uh, commission from something that had been in place for 200 years. They said, let's free it all up. It's free and open competition now. No more fixed rates. The next day, the newspaper had a c- couple articles about it. One was, was really important to me, Merrill Lynch raises the rates 3%. And I said, oh, my God, I have got a heck of a business. If I can just keep it together, keep our people motivated and so forth, raise enough money to build the capital of the company, I got a heck of a business. And then what led you to think you should sell the business? Well, it was all a part of raising capital. I didn't have access to Wall Street. They hated me because I was a competitor and I was forming a really a, a strong competitive, competitive force. And so the last person they wanted to support was me. Right. Which is, looking back, is pretty funny. But uh, many of them wish they had now because stock price did really, really well over the next uh, ensuing years. Uh, but at the very beginning, the, the money was a struggle, always trying to raise money, friends, relatives, and so forth. And that was not always completely successful, but we scraped along. And I convinced certain people that we had a great uh, future and maybe they ought to think about an investment in the company. So eventually we, we did get there, but the, always that pressure. And so when Bank of America came around to buy us, and they flashed a couple numbers in front of me, and I came from from nothing. I said, "Oh my God, is that that's a heck of a lot of money? Maybe I should consider that because it really improved my net worth, going from zero to a lot, twenty million. <laughs> <laughs> what happened when they make this investment in you? Are you allowed to run Charles Schwab as a wholly owned sub, or yeah. did they try to integrate you? No, no, uh, that's I insisted upon. We kept our same auditors, our same attorneys, our same staff. I had a, a separate board, so we were completely sort of an independent subsidiary. But yes, they owned all our stock, so they could pull the switch on me if they wanted to at any particular time, but they didn't, and they let us flourish, and we grew from 1981 right on through to 1985. We kept compounding and compounding, so all the stuff we were doing at Schwab was fantastic. Our customers really loved us, and we did perform really well for the bank, but the bank fell into bad times. Itself. The bank is separate of you. The the parent company fell into bad times. There's some bad loans to South America. Shippers in Greece were canceling on some of their debt, and they had lots of issues to deal with. So the bank fell in these bad times and started selling a few assets. They had to sell their building. They sold this thing. And then finally I said, why don't you sell my company back to me? And uh, we eventually worked out that transaction. And when did that happen? That happened in 1987. Oh, what a funny year to have something big happen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was, that was the, as I call it, the tsunami year. That was all kinds of things went on. So it's a very interesting thing in the book itself. talks about these things. It was fun for me to go back and recast all the little elements that we had to go through. But it's a pretty exciting time. Exciting is not the word I would have used because I was a young pup trader on the floor of the Commodities Exchange. My father was a specialist on the floor of the American Stock Exchange. My uncle was a specialist on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. So it was a dramatic time. That's what I would say. And it was intense. You experienced that loss, that dramatic day. Do individuals who are trading at Schwab jump ship or do they stay in? Well, for the most part, people stand. I mean, uh, there's a fraction that might be two or three percent that sort of panic as such. But, you know, experienced investors know markets do go down. And unfortunately, when they do go down, they go down much faster than they go up. And so recoveries always take a little bit more time than, than the actual drop. But the drop, you know, for most of us, think it's an opportunity. Oh, You're yeah. You're buying things at incredible prices. I love I love when people go nuts about yeah. when the market, like even this past summer, yeah. the market goes down. And I said, wait, you're buying into your 401k. Yeah. Six percent cheaper than you did six weeks ago. Yeah, why, Be why? happy about yeah. that. I mean, you go to we all go to sales all over the world, but when in stocks are on sales, it seems like people are more fearful. 
How was the advent of online trading? What did that mean for your company? Our efficiency of doing a trade has grown and grown and grown. So the cost of us doing a trade is very nominal, frankly. And so we reduced our prices all the way along for the last 20 years or so until finally last week we find let's make trading just free. Which is a mind-blowing concept. I, I'm so sad that my father's not alive to see this because I remember he used to say, we're on our way to zero. And people would be like, what are you, crazy, Albie? Like, you're not what, zero. They got to make money, right? Yeah, yeah, There's no yeah. – so – now you went from was it four ninety five or four ninety five? Four ninety five. But let's just call it yeah. five bucks to trade. Now it goes to zero, and people are thinking, "Wait a minute, how are these guys making money? Yeah. What are they going to do to make up for that five bucks that they're losing?" Well, there's a variety of ways. We have people who use us for as an advisor, so we charge a small fee for doing that. If you want an advised account, we have a bank, so we make some money on the interest rates between the what interest rates are and what we pay our clients in terms of their deposit accounts. So there's always little ways to make money, and but the most critical thing is to have customers and have a lot of customers. And so we are very proud about the fact that we have almost $4 trillion, and I say that with a T, of client assets with us. And so given all that, we thought, well, why not? Let's deliver on to our clients a greater value, like zero, and so maybe we'll attract more customers. What do you think about the advent of robo-advisors? You have a service through Charles Schwab where you can put your money into an account and basically take your risk profile and an algorithm is going to do the rest. What do you think of that? Well, I think it's an incredibly efficient way to, for most, the average person doesn't have the time to be thinking about this stock or that stock and go through all the machinations of, oh, I'm the market's down, I should buy. We do it for you sort of automatically. We also do tax loss harvesting for you, meaning we sell the stocks that you might have had a little loss in the portfolio and garner the loss there to offset gains that you might have in your account. There's all kinds of things that we do do automatically for people. And so really a simple way to sort of accumulate money over a long period of time. So I guess the question is, if we watched you guys be the ones who broke through and pushed down trading costs to zero, could you ever see a time where advice pricing starts to drop in a similar way? I mean, now there's no guy sitting in a big fat Merrill Lynch office who really can get away with charging eight and a quarter percent for a mutual fund anymore, no, right? No. Okay. So I would presume that if Charles Schwab and Vanguard are both making the jump into advice, that that is going to put price pressure downward. Do you agree with that? Well, I think advice is a different thing. It's a complicated it's an education process that goes on. And what has happened over the last bunch of years is schools don't do enough help, enough education about financial decision making. What should I do in my life and all of that? So, and so I'm doing a lot of work in financial literacy, but I think people got to get a little bit informed. What, what are my requirements? What do I have to do in an overall sense? So they're not just completely deaf and dumb about the whole thing, but they've got to put some time in to understand what it is to mean about saving. What am I trying to do? What's my goals? What's what's my opportunity? This is Jill on Money. Hi, it's Jill Schlesinger, certified financial planner, CBS News business analyst, and host of this, the Jill on Money podcast. I'm here to tell you about our sponsor, Marcus by Goldman Sachs. Marcus is part of a storied company that's been a leader in financial services for generations. Marcus offers simple, secure access to FDIC-insured savings products, including a high-yield online savings account that earns four times the national average. Marcus also offers certificates of deposit, including a no-penalty CD. Get inspired by your savings account and start saving today to help meet your financial goals tomorrow. You can money. Visit Marcus.com forward slash save. National average data provided by Informa and accuracy cannot be guaranteed. Marcus Deposits products provided by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, member FDIC. And now back to our interview with Chuck Schwab. Is the age of a managed mutual fund coming to an end? Yes, I think so. Index funds have been so prominent in the last 10 years or so. They've grown to half of the new funds that are being uh, built up today. 
And so it's it's very difficult to compete against an index fund because the costs are so much higher than an index fund. And so people want to go lower costs. Do you think that there is a danger? There are some folks who are running around saying, hey, you know what? Everybody's in the index. Market goes down. Everyone's going to try to get out at the same time. It's going to be a cascading downside risk that we've now all piled into. I don't think it's going to be any different than before. The market might might drop on those really awful days, 10%, 15%. But you don't go in investing with the thought that it's going to be always a, an up day. It has to be many down days, too, along the way. That's what markets do. And you just have to have that pure and simple understanding markets are going to fluctuate. You think that it was helpful that you were outside of, like, the New York Wall Street crowd, that you could think beyond the way business was oh, done? Oh, boy. When I think back of my background, there are many lucky moments. But I think the luck was for me that I was brought up on the West Coast, went to Stanford, and was around a lot of innovative-type people. And so being on the West Coast, I wasn't part of Wall Street, and the old-fashioned ways of doing things. I could think about what would customers really like? if we were to really develop something new and different. So I, I interviewed Michael Lewis a while back. Yeah, he's we, a, we, an interesting guy. Yeah. He lives in Oakland. Yes, he does. And we had this very funny conversation because <clears throat> he said, we were talking about how so much of investing, there is an element where people start talking it as if it were gambling. And he says, you know, it's not gambling. He said, you know, if you talk to really old-time traders and investors – They'll never tell you about their best trade. They'll always tell you about their worst trade. And he said, and that's what I found interviewing golfers. Professional golfers never tell me about their best round of golf. They tell me how the three holes that blew the whole tournament. And so I'm wondering for you what you feel like is misunderstood among the investment community about that this is not gambling. So what is it? What is it? How should we be thinking about this? Well, I think there's a lot of misunderstandings about that. I mean, to me, the lottery is gambling. You go down and buy your ticket for two dollars and forget about it. And later they whirl the pool, and all of a sudden the winning number comes out. Investing, you're actually buying into. Think about the fact: the first time you you loved McDonald's hamburger, and then all of a sudden, gee, that's pretty interesting. And then then you notice they build a second McDonald's hamburger, and then you build a third. What does that really mean? It means they have more customers, and all of a sudden now they got ten thousand. McDonald's, and so it's been an enormous accretion in value created by that company. That's called growth, and that's what you really can get in investing in great companies who have long history of serving customers. Therefore, customers pay good money for these things, and they build new outfits, new ideas, new innovation. That's what the crux of our great system here in America is all about, the innovation of new things and the creativity of mind do that and allow us to do that. And by doing that, you're creating value. And that's investors who see that and identify those great growth opportunities. They're the successful investors. We've been getting some questions. We take listeners, they call up and they want to ask us questions. And they'll often say things like, well, I want to get 100% out of the market or I want to put all my money in. Can you talk a little bit about your experience with trying to time the market? I've never been successful at it. Sometimes I think I can, and I've tried it many, many times, of course, when I think a bottom is hit. And uh, I would say of the last 10 bottoms, I probably was correct maybe one out of the 10 times, and I was really happy about that. When I encouraged my daughter to get in now, today's the day, November 9th is the day <laughs> to get in. We, we were actually skiing. I said, today's the day. We finished that after that morning of skiing. I said, Looking at the reports today, this is the day. Take every penny you have in your pocketbook and put it in the market. But that doesn't happen every time. So how do you look at the landscape now? You are in the Bay Area. There's a lot of innovation. We're hearing so much about many of these companies, these unicorns who are remaining private for much longer yeah. than, say, folks who right. did in your time right. when you were before you went public. What is the, what's the upside and downside of being a public versus a private company? And, and is there any lesson that we should take in observing it? Well, it's, it's quite important. It's your access to capital. A company grows and needs capital, needs new capital. It just doesn't come fall off of trees uh, blindly. So you want to 
induce investors to see your opportunity and, and of course, buy your stock and so forth. It also allows those people who have worked for you for a long period of time, I always like to participate, have every one of my employees participate in the upside of the company, that they are bought into the concept, the purpose of what we do as a company, and that's truly important to have that public available because, you know, we're, we're now a 40-year-old company. You know, many people are retiring, so why shouldn't they be able to take their stock and convert to cash and to fixed income that, that will support them through the retirement years? Talk about the financial services landscape. Is there anything at this point in your career that keeps you up at night? Is there anything that you're worried about? I think we're in fantastic shape. I think the advent of technology over the last 20 years, the internet has just brought all this flow of information to everyone. And so it's a great value. Financial services are a fantastic value for people, just like some other things in modern world today because the advent of technology. What about these um, fintech companies that were really looking like hot and then folks like Schwab jumped in and sort of ate their lunch. So if I had a fintech company five years ago that I thought was like, oh, my, I'm on the way to getting a billion-dollar valuation, now you're in the business and Vanguard's in the business. Is my fintech company now not worth quite as much? Well, I don't know about that. I mean, we all look at great ideas, Mm -hmm. and so nobody in our business is above copying a great idea. And we see a great idea, or some people going to zero commissions, we'll say, or something else, a robo thing. It's a great idea, and customers really like it. Man, we're going to go right into it also. How would you decide whether to buy that or to create it? Well, it's very simple mathematics. How much will it cost you to build that capability? Mm -hmm. And if the little firm has some really uh, outstanding ideas, patents and so forth, we'll try to buy them. Do you have an insurance arm? We have some insurance. It's very modest in size. We've never been big advancers of insurance thing. And we think it's somewhat expensive. In fact, that may be another opportunity. Yeah. Well, I was thinking that it would be great if someone like, let's say, Chuck Schwab could say, yeah, the idea of an annuity is so appealing, right? It is. Because in your brain, in your little, you know, human brain, you say, yeah, I just want someone to pay me with my money. I want my own pension. But of course, the insurance industry, I'll say you don't have to, is a bunch of pigs and they charge too much Way to create too much. that. Oh, it's, it's very, very, annuities are incredibly expensive. And not only that, then you get locked in. If something changes in your life, something dramatic happens and you want to reverse it all. Uh, there are other ways, I think, to go about it that are similar, uh, highly competitive, lower cost. And, and so we'll be helping our clients with those kinds of I decisions. can't wait for that. Will you come back or maybe your daughter will I, come I back? Promise. All I right. promise. I promise. Your daughter carries in the business, yes, right? She Anyone is. else? Any other kids? That's the only five children I have. Only one's in the business. She runs our non for profit entities like foundation, our, our charitable giving uh, institution that we have for our clients. Uh, she also does a lot in financial literacy, uh, helping. Men Why and women. your other four kids were very smart not to go into the business? I said to them, <laughs> "Well, I want them to follow their passions, and lots of them didn't have the passion. Some are non for profit passion; they want to help people, mm-hmm. which I understand. We all do, of course. Some want to do it full time, and others want to do venture capital. Uh, so they all do different things in life. And they're all in the Bay Area. Everyone on the West uh, Coast for pretty you. Pretty much in the Bay Area. One one lives in Los Angeles. What do you think right now about let's sort of big picture economy? You know, part of your business is, as you said, collecting the spread between what you pay out on your money market and that that float and right. and what you're using it for. How will that business fare if interest rates continue to go down? Well, it'll be. Obviously, margins will shrink some, and so we'll have to be innovative and think of some other things that might be helpful to our clients and they may want to use. So we're always open for that. And, we, you know, we always want the best outcome for our clients, and no matter what. So we'll figure out something. I and mean, we've done it for 40 years, and we'll do it for the next 40 years. We started the interview, and I said, what was your best career or money decision? You said your best career decision was starting this company. Right. What was your worst? Oh, my goodness. It's all outlined in my book. I've had many little... Uh, pick your worst. <laughs> pick my worst. Well, 
you know, that's part of life. You got to have some burn your fingers along the way, and then you don't do it again. And uh, one that has to almost learn most of my things by personal experience. <laughs> I try to read about them, but nothing better and more informative than doing it yourself. Mm, sad but true. The only way out is to go right through yes, it, isn't right it? Through it. You're listening to Jill on Money. Okay, it's time for the Marcus Minute. We're presented by Marcus by Goldman Sachs. Sitting in the hot seat today, Chuck Schwab, are you ready to play? Yes. All right, here we go. What is one word to describe your relationship with money? Keep it close to me. What's always worth spending on? Investments. What's the dumbest thing you've spent money on? Oh, frivolous things that I can't see anymore. How much do you spend on a haircut? A hundred dollars. It's your last day on earth. You've got a hundred bucks in your pocket. What would your last meal be? It would probably be a hot dog. Chuck Schwab, the book is called Invested, Changing Forever the Way Americans Invest. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Thanks so much to Chuck Schwab. The book is called Invested, Changing Forever the Way Americans Invest. We drop new episodes of Jill on Money every Tuesday and Thursday. Sometimes we sneak in a bonus episode, too. If you don't want to miss any of these great pieces of content, subscribe to us on Apple, Stitcher, Radio.com, Google Play, anywhere else you get your favorite podcasts. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Mark Talercio is our executive producer. We're distributed by Cadence 13. And our show is presented by Marcus by Goldman Sachs. See you next week.